Part three, what can Nietzsche teach us? So let's just kind of put this in a bit of a context of today then. So what do we think Nietzsche would make of our kind of cultural, I guess, shared values um, of today? You know, self-sacrifice is a good thing. It's a good thing to forgive others if they do bad things to you. Would, would Nietzsche agree with that? Would he, would he disagree with it? Well, the forgiveness one is interesting. If you are um, so above it that you have no problem sort of like saying, yeah, that doesn't really bother me, he'd be for that. So, you know, what you see Nietzsche, I mean, there's been a lot of talk about you know, this sort of comparison. Nietzsche's, let's call it Superman or whatever, is similar to Aristotle's great souled person. They, they just don't let this little piddly crap get to them. So, you know, you scratch their car, it's just a car, you know. Um, now, there's, there's certain things, certain lines you could cross where then they, they would probably go after you. They're not going to forgive mm -hmm. that. The ordinary person engaging in forgiveness, like, you know, you, uh, you slept with my wife, right? Um, and uh, I'll forgive you and forgive her uh, because I want, you know, the relations between us to be okay. Um, Nietzsche would say, no, you're this is clearly just uh, bad stuff on, on your part. Uh, you're despicable. Uh, you're probably you're probably not forgiving to begin with. You're probably doing it passive aggressively with what he called resentment. <laughs> you know, yeah. if you do actually give that up, uh, what a what a, a schmuck you are. You know, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. So I, I I mean, some of this would would be dependent on how you're doing it. You know. Yeah. So he wants us to get rid of our, these moral lords, is this right? He wants us to slay the dragon of moral lords and find our new values and this idea of the will to power that we've touched on. How, how would we go about doing this? What does it look like in, in the real world, slaying your moral lords? And then how do we find, how do we say yes to life for Nietzsche? Well, I think part of it would be to not think of morality in terms of rules at all, in terms of thou yeah. shalt not. Um, mm. But the way he puts it, think of it in, in a matter of I will. Uh, so there, we have a very strong undercurrent, you know, an ethical undercurrent here of the, sort of the self-empowerment movement. And I think Nietzsche would have no problem with somebody being generous, for instance, if they're doing so out of an overflow of energy. You know, mm. you've got your yourself together so that you can be the bigger person in a, yeah. in a, so then it's, but if you're just doing so out of, because you you think you're supposed to, then again you're just going to resent that. If you're if you give of yourself every day, um, because this is just what's expected of you, then that's not actually taking yourself as a human being and your own needs seriously. Mm -hmm. That you really so it might be uh, you know apply the mask to yourself before aiding others. Maybe that would be uh, yeah. the, the, an airline reference. Um, <laughs> I think that's entirely right. Yeah. I, I, uh, you know, and if you think of how this would apply to relationships, I think if we we're talking about personal relationships, like a friendship or a romantic relationship, Nietzsche would see these as sort of like constantly being renegotiated or, you know, as, as involving a kind of spontaneity rather than saying, well, you, you know, you did this thing for me before, so now you're stuck doing it again. Uh, because you like created an implicit contract with me, you know. I think Nietzsche would say that's not the way. Uh, I mean, that's the way it does work for most people, and that's what's wrong with most people. <laughs> you know, that's not the way it's supposed to work for us. So um, perhaps I'm, my reading of Nietzsche has been completely wrong because I try and do follow the philosophies that I'm reading in in life and see see how they're playing out. So I've been cutting up people in traffic. I haven't been doing the washing up. <laughs> seems like these moral orts I'm trying to slay. It seems like I'm becoming a more evil person. Does this, is Nietzsche trying to make me more evil? Well, you have to remember that evil for him is, is uh, part of that, that whole secondary evaluation. And, you know, we want to get beyond good and evil back to, to good and bad rather than just, just good and evil. So, in, you know, if we were asking ourselves, well, is this going to make me evil? Nietzsche would say, you're still stuck in the same original problem. Oh, okay. I haven't, I haven't, um, I haven't slayed the dragon, really. Brian Later, who did an interview with Philosophy Bites, there's an episode, and I'll link to it on the website. He speaks about four myths that people have about Nietzsche. And he thinks that this idea of the will to power isn't exactly, isn't the guiding force of, of Nietzsche's work. It, one being that the will to power was uh, published by Elizabeth after he, after he's died, and it doesn't play a central role in his philosophies, his arguments. So, does he? His argument is that the genealogy of morals 
is Nietzsche saying, look, look where these morals have came from. Look, look at the slave revolt. Uh, think about the morals you have, these moral orts you have. Okay, now we've looked at it uh, from a historiographical uh, point of view. Now what do you think of them is his question. He's trying to say, look where they've came from, look at their origins. What do you think of these morals now? Rather than saying, like he was in Truth and Lying, which went unpublished, where Nietzsche's yeah. saying there's not truth or lying, there's no truth to the capital T, truth and lying are relative, they're Darwinian social constructs so we can function as a society, but there's no real truth, no real lying. So that went unpublished is his argument, so that's not what Nietzsche thought. And then in the genealogy of morals, he's saying, just just think about where these have came from in the kind of philologist way that he would in his early career. What are our thoughts on this? Well, I think he's wrong. Um, I mean, will to power comes up in the genealogy at a number of points, uh, as well as in the rest of the published works. So if that's the, the main basis of the argument, it's not a very... Philo- and just from a philological perspective, it's not a very good argument. So we're saying that the, what is this will to power then? If it's such an important part of Nietzsche's philosophy, what's he mean by power? Should we unpack this? Is it just me trying to be king of the road or me trying to, you know, if I could poison my work colleagues so I could achieve the highest role in my job? What, what's he saying here? What, what does it involve? What is this idea of power? Well, I gave my version, which is that for the most part, he's talking about, clearly in some passages, he's talking about his own literary influence and, more broadly speaking, the the power over the world of ideas, which he really does think thinks matters a lot, you know, has actual practical consequences, that this slave revolt in values had real political consequences, real ethical consequences, mm-hmm. and in fact, having the wrong values... You know, could if we fall victim to nihilism, well, mass suicides. Like, there's no reason to live if you don't have these things uh, in check. So, I think uh, you know, the will to power, in, in a certain way, is is a is a more general way of talking about the instincts. Um, you know, that we had. You can see it in in animals. It's not just the survival of the fittest. Mm. The fittest don't just want to huddle on the end of things, hiding from predators. Mm-hmm. Uh, that the they want us to be out uh, influencing the world in whatever way that means. And for him, that meant uh, because you know he's living in a, in a civilization <laughs> where you can't just go and beat on people. Uh, that means influencing how they think. Is this linking in with Freud's idea of the pleasure principle then? So we've got Nietzsche saying the will to power. is uh, Freud's essentially saying the will to pleasure. Are we seeing Nietzsche's influence on him there? Is this essentially the same point? That power guides evolution for Nietzsche it helps us survive. And that's what we're aiming for. That's our telos. Well, that, that's part of it. But, I mean, Freud also has the death instinct, and that would mm. fit in with it as well. Um, when you ask, well, what is power? Nietzsche doesn't have just one thing that he considers power. So what Mark is talking about, we might say like cultural power in which people um, are part of, you know, maybe a cultural marketplace and we get, you know, this is the way some theorists, they have a certain market share. We could talk about jockeying for for position or things like that. That's one aspect of it. Um, There's other aspects involved in interpersonal relationships where we do things to each other or demand things of each other and sometimes get, you know, what we want, even though the other person doesn't want to give it. Or, you know, when, you know, one way to tell that we really have power over them is that we do get them to want what we want them to want. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and this could, so this can fit in with, with, with Freud in terms of like wanting to attain pleasure, but also, you know, the death or destructive instinct is there as well. And, and sometimes the will to power is displayed precisely in, um, destroying things and destroying people or destroying relationships, often for stupid reasons, but but mm. because you can do it, you know. So, you know, I want to say one other thing, though. I mean, Leiter could be wrong in his his argument why the will to power isn't, in, you know, most important concept in Nietzsche, and it still might not be the most important concept in Nietzsche. He, I, I was only pointing out that his his argument for it doesn't sound like a good argument. Um, there have been people who have taken Nietzsche's will to power as being really central. You know, Kaufman, uh, important translator of him early on. Uh, Heidegger took it as being one of the key ideas. Uh, Deleuze, you know, in his uh, recent interpretation, talks in terms of force rather than power. But yeah. um, 
So I, it is, I don't know, it is something that's certainly taken seriously by, by a lot of the secondary literature on him. Can I, we can't really go through an introduction to Nietzsche without giving the, uh, the most famous quote uh, from Nietzsche. So let me just lay it out here. Which one is that? <laughs> uh, I thought the most common one you hear amongst the general public is, uh, is God is dead, is it not? Can you think of a more... I, well, oh, yeah, you're being I, I, you, sorry. I didn't detect the sarcasm. Are you being sarcastic, or is no, that just no, no, I'm not. Felt? No, I, I just don't. I, I don't know myself. That's well, why I'm okay. fascinated by these, these, these things. When you're a little too close to it, it's, it's kind of hard to like. People will ask me, for example, oh, you know, what, what secondary literature should I read to help me with Plato? And I'm like, Jesus, I don't know. I started reading Plato <laughs> so long ago. I don't, you know, I don't really read the secondary literature unless I'm writing an article, anyway. Um, I, I'm too, I'm too close to the, the stuff to be able to know what other people are, are making of it in any reliable mm. way. You know? So, so it makes you a bad uh, advice giver. So I'm fascinated yeah. to know what the most in, you know, the most, uh, widespread, uh, quotes about Nietzsche actually are. God is dead. God remains dead. And we have killed him. How shall we comfort ourselves? The murderers of all murderers. What was holiest and mightiest of all that the world has yet owned has bled to death under our knives? Who will wipe the blood off us? He goes on in that quotation, the last uh, sentence here, saying, Must we ourselves become gods simply to appear worthy of it? And that's from the gay science. Now, if I say, uh, in Thus Spoke Zarathustra, he says, Dead are all gods. Now we want the overman to live. So what's this idea of the overman? How is he saying here, now we've... Now we've killed God. And what does he mean by saying, now we've killed God? And what's he saying we should do now? Once we realize God is dead, what is the overman? Should we unpack this idea? So the overall story, I think, is that historically, with the rise of science, dogmatic religion is no longer tenable. Right? Obviously, there are indiv lots of individuals and even you know, it, maybe even the majority of individuals that still believe in God, but he thinks, at least, for any clear thinking person, these old time religious ideas are just not going to make sense to you. So in that sense, God is dead for the intellectual elite <laughs> that he would point to. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, he wants to really dramatize that and say that we have to become creators of value because he doesn't want what he thinks happened in a lot of uh, not explicitly theological moralists like Kant, where you get rid of the idea that we, we do this, we have moral laws because God gives them to us, but we still end up with pretty much the same moral laws anyway. Um, and so that, again, it's, it's kind of like if you are an atheist, you're rejecting uh, your elders who have maybe you were raised in a, in a strict religion. Um, you reject that, but then you still kind of think in those terms that you were brought up. That he thinks, yeah. Nietzsche thinks that we have to do really more uh, deep thinking ourselves, more self self coaching, more uh, really create this whole new vocabulary, a whole new you know. This is why he would throw out something like the will to power, which might sound like it's so. Oh, you know that's that's sounds very animalistic. That sounds mm. he, he's trying to give an yeah. you know because we are so used to thinking in these this. Uh, morality of altruism for instance um you know he I, this is again why i think he talking out of his ass might be too strong but he <laughs> exaggerates you know the other way because he's trying to trying to sock your thinking out of these traditional patterns and ultimately get you thinking for yourself by giving you something that's even more extreme sort of the the other direction you know in a particular passage and this is why he might seem inconsistent in different parts of his work because he's kind of giving different extremes or moving in different ways. So I, again, I, I would not literally, the God is dead, we have killed him, is not something that you can take as a literal uh, metaphysical claim mm -hmm. in any way. It's, it's a literary way of talking about, well, maybe something like what I just described, but it'd be interesting to hear what, what Greg thinks of that. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's, that's right. Um, I mean, I'd, I'd make it a little bit more, complicated by saying that Christianity <clears throat> wound up revealing itself to itself, not just by, by science, but, but by working itself out that it was, you know, insufficient. And then Nietzsche sees the sciences as doing the same thing and philosophy is doing the same thing. Um, that's sort of a consistent story he, he tells. 
Um, and so he talks about it as the devaluation of the highest value by itself, right? And then we're left with, well, what the hell's hang- what what is everything hanging on? Um, and then you know this question of well, okay, so maybe stepping into this void, we've got the Superman, but then who is that? You know, and what? Here's the more interesting question: not only well, what's a Superman? But what's the relationship of the rest of us poor schmucks to to this Superman? You know, are we just there to like you know be his stepping stones? Uh, are we supposed to be worshiping him? Are we supposed to be paving his way? Nietzsche himself is clearly not the Superman. He's he's laying in bed half the time with terrible migraines, uh, like Mark <laughs> pointed out, writing in these windows that he that he's got. So he's not a I mean, Nietzsche talks all the time about physical health and robustness. He doesn't have that. Um, he's he he's sort of a herald, isn't he? Does he give some examples of who he thinks the over, overman would look? Well, like? yeah, and and this is where it gets this is where it gets really interesting. The examples that he gives, there's always some flaw with them as well. So, mm. uh, you know, um, Napoleon is 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 is, is one. Uh, I don't think he actually at any point calls Napoleon an, a Superman, but right. he he talks about him. Um, but then you know there's there's problems with with him, and and I think that points to the fact that the Superman is not going to be this um, has a totally figured out figure. Maybe it's more like the person who's discussed in the third section of the genealogy of morals who's halfway sick and somehow manages to throw off uh, what what slave morality has, has wrought, but is very different than the blonde beast of prey that was, you know, the warrior class described earlier on. So maybe Superman is a relative term rather than an absolute I think Superman is just as strongly a literary device as the uh, God is dead thing. I don't think that there's a... Uh, yeah, does he even use that term outside of the uh, Thus Spake Zarathustra, where, you know, his most overtly literary work? Yeah, he does. Um, it's not, it's not uh, used a hell of a lot, but it does occur in other texts, and I'm struggling to remember which, which ones. So clearly he sees it as a virtue to have a lot of energy to have this will to power, Mm -hmm. this connection to the instincts very strong in you. And Mm -hmm. if you were that kind of person, um, but had the critical skills, had a strong intellectual conscience is a, is a thing that he uses. Um, then you would be, you know, this art artistic Socrates is, is one of the, the, uh, pictures that's given sometime because you know socrates again in his not like plato who ultimately wanted to uh, promote the world of the forms and things but socrates as a critic as somebody who's driving through the the uh, the bull you know is is something that is uh, a you know a a force into himself that that would be something to well i don't know if exactly emulate but you know so if you if you posit this idea that you know, energy is good. Strength is good. Uh, flexibility is good. You know, maybe you could just like the, uh, you could at least play with the idea of having a sort of sage character of that, Mm. you know, and I think that's what the Superman says, but, but elsewhere, Nietzsche specifically says that the whole moral psychology of putting, you know, thinking, what would Jesus do or, or anybody like that? What would Napoleon do that trying to change yourself in that way doesn't work it is it is denying it's taking the force that is within you and saying forget that i want to you know and trying to adopt something external this this yeah, picture yeah. of a of a virtuous man that i will then try to emulate like no virtue has to come from within and that means that everybody's virtue maybe is going to be a little different there are going to be multiple ways of being an impressive human being yeah, I mean, it's, it's probably also going to be a conflicted person. He talks about in Thus Spoke Zarathustra, our virtues are should be at war with each other, you know, um, because we get a kind of tension out of out of that that that's useful for us. I mean, it's interesting with the Superman thing because I think a lot of people, you know, they, they, not just for Nietzsche but other existentialist figures as well, you know, it, it's very different reading Nietzsche as a teenager, say. And being like, oh, I'm going to be the Superman then, you know, <laughs> screw mom and dad, screw, <laughs> screw the teachers, you know, I'm going to like be this, this rebel. And for a long time, I actually associated existentialism with that, not just, not least because I did that myself. And then when I start co- going back and rereading these thinkers in my, you know, uh, late thirties, early forties, I'm struck by just how little I actually seem to have read. 
I let my eyes go over it and didn't register it and how little I understood. Um, because I think this, Mark's right, this Superman is not just going to be like the guy who says, all right, I'm going to be the next Napoleon. <laughs> you, there, there can only be one Napoleon, right? Mm. Um, so so where, where, would, where would we find them? I, I don't really know, but it's definitely not going to be like in leadership literature or <laughs> those sorts of things, you know? It's it's not just uh, Christianity and these uh, true world theories or the slave morality, is it that we that we find um, these these morals, these moral orts, or perhaps some uh, some peace of mind in that we can go beyond the physical world and there's this the pearly gates beyond it. He's got this brilliant quote: uh, two great European narcotics. There are alcohol and Christianity. What's he getting at here? Because we've got a lot of for any listeners who are just atheists who are thinking this doesn't apply to me. I I don't uh, I don't forgive and I don't go to church and I don't have these moral thoughts and my my virtue comes from within. As they're sat here now drinking a whiskey, listening to this podcast. Well, what, what's, I mean, let, what's Nietzsche hung yeah. up on here? Well, let's say this though: when it comes to contemporary Christianity. Um, Neither are many of the the contemporary Christians forgiving or going to church. You know? <laughs> they just, when they're being polled about whether they're Christian or not, they say yes rather than saying none. You know. <laughs> yeah, but what's, okay, so what's what's he getting at here with the alcohol point though? Are we, am I just as wrapped into this uh, these true what this? The, am I still in this first stage of these? Uh, what, what are these three stages of transformation? Am I still locked into this this first one? Well, you know, he I, I brought up him criticizing the the Germans, um, and he in the genealogy he talks about the Middle Ages as being this this age essentially of people just drinking alcohol far too much, <laughs> <laughs> in part because that was you know how they dealt with the the, the problems with the water and bacteria yeah. at the time. But and he, and he particularly associates this with the Germans. You know, I think <laughs> if if you if we don't just talk about say alcohol, but but drugs in general or other things mm. that we could use to like nar- narcoticize ourselves, like endlessly you know binge watching Netflix so as not to think about things. You know, these are things that that keep us from being able to see the situation that we're in. You know, if you're if you're just having a drink or two with with friends or like listening to this podcast, um, we know that a little bit of alcohol actually lowers inhibitions and actually makes you a little bit more creative, um, can have some positive effects. If you're drinking, you know, you're just going to the gas station every day to get your six pack because that's part of your routine. That's that's a bit different. Now you're talking about uh, not just taking the edge off, but taking any edge off, perhaps. So what is it that Nietzsche can teach us? What are we taking? We've unpacked there the idea of the overman, the idea that we should slay the dragon of moral orts, and that we shouldn't find comfort in these ideas of uh, in, in watching Netflix or drinking alcohol or thinking there's a set of pearly gates beyond the physical world. Um, so the idea is, Greg, as you've just articulated, that we don't want to um, cloud uh, what, what is actually there. We want to experience the world. And in this realist sense, we were mentioning earlier. Now, Nietzsche speaks a lot about suffering, doesn't he? He talks about the, he famously wishes, or perhaps you can correct me if I'm wrong here, this is another one of the ideas the general public might hold of thinking about Nietzsche. Nietzsche wishes his friends and his family, those he loves the most, he wants them to suffer because he sees this as a good thing. Does, is this right? Does Nietzsche actually want us to experience all the pains and torments in the world? Is this a good thing for Nietzsche? Again, wouldn't this make us kind of more more interesting? You know, the uh, whatever doesn't kill me makes me stronger. I think that is a a loose quote, mm. you know, that from Nietzsche. Uh, but at the same time, that doesn't mean that you should. I, I guess he he doesn't have an advice column, right? That's not that's not how <laughs> he writes. Yeah, yeah. So he's not giving specific guidance on particular appropriate reactions in certain situations. And mm. from what I had heard about his personal life, he was very polite as an individual. Hmm. Um, he was not going around, you know, imposing his will <laughs> in an obnoxious way on people. You, you know, you might read this in terms of the, uh, the, what's going on in the news right now about all these, these, these men in the entertainment industry exerting their power over wit. Like, yeah. I don't think you would, <laughs> I, I don't think Nietzsche gives a clear answer on that. Like he was sexist enough that he might've been fine with it. <laughs> Honestly, but I think a more profitable way to interpret him is 
wow, it would really show that you have a lot of self-confidence and energy and vitality if you can actually listen to what other people are saying to you. So when a whole oppressed class, you know, whether that you're talking about uh, uh, arguments about privilege or all this, mm-hmm. this kind of stuff, um, if you can actually give that stuff a really fair hearing and make sure that you're not inadvertently stepping on people in a way that on reflection, you don't like, you don't want to be that kind of person. Um, I think one can make a very, a Nietzschean argument that that kind of stuff is okay and not go with taking him more literally that, yeah, you should just not care about what other people think and kind of be rude in daily situations. Yeah. And you know, with suffering, it, it, a lot of it depends on how we frame it and what we make of it. So, you know, something that, I mean, th- th- that's right. There's that what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. It makes me stronger if I understand it in such a way that it's, um, you know, not, not making me hostile to everybody else. Part of what Nietzsche talks about as the dynamic of, of resentment stems from being made to suffer, somebody doing things to you you don't like, and then not being able to retaliate maybe because you need to keep the job or um, because, uh, you know, you'll get beaten if, if you retaliate or, or just the fear that, that you've got that you're not up to, to actually standing up for yourself. And then it drives down deeper. That's an example of, of suffering you know, turning into something that's not just poisonous for that, that person, but poisonous for the, the culture. But, you know, there's other ways of taking your suffering and transforming it and, and making it into something, you know, greater, you know, almost well, sort of like, you know, doing, this is not a great metaphor, but doing something with your scar tissue, you know. I know he does not want us to turn into the what he calls the last man. That's sort of his corresponding yeah. Yeah. opposite to the the overman, um, which I I think the if you remember the movie Wall E, like what the people yeah. are all doing <laughs> that they're just in these these recliner couches with their TVs in front. You know, this is the the worst thing. This is the ge- degeneracy that he thinks society has been headed toward mm. you know since his time with the uh, improvement of technology and but at the same time we don't want to go back and you know have to be just have a life of hardship mm. uh, you know working on a subsi- doing subsistence farming or something he, the, yeah. his solution is never to turn back the clock it's to figure out what is the way forward what what was good about the suffering that we got out of necessity in our historical past that drove us to be creative and you know drive progress forward and and give us the the opportunities that we have now um we don't want to be lulled into submission so that in 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 that sense he does want suffering but it might be you know the way that an athlete might want suffering that i want you know no pain no gain yeah yeah let us pause for a moment and hear a quick message from our sponsors the new college of the humanities My name is Jess. I'm a third year student here at NCH, which means I only have nine months left, which is really sad. I study philosophy with English, and I'm also the president of the student union. There are many ways you can get involved with the union. One is you can come to our meetings. We're always welcome to having guests. We actually really love it. You could join the events committee, which works alongside the events officer to plan everything that happens in NCH. Elections happen at the end of the first term, so you'll have had an entire term to settle in, to figure out where your place is in NCH, and then you can run for a position on the union yourself. Like many students, my first year at university was a bit of a challenge. I experienced some mental health difficulties. I started um, experiencing anxiety and had the occasional panic attack. And being at NCH, I received the most incredible support I could have ever wanted. My friends and my fellow students who I wasn't even that close to were always there for me. And the systems that we have in college are fantastic. Liberal arts inspired degrees in the humanities and social sciences. Gold standard teaching with one-to-one tutorials and small interactive seminars. Lectures by world-renowned professors including A.C. Grayling, Daniel C. Dennett, and Steven Pinker. You can still apply directly to NCH London for 2018 entry and be considered for a scholarship. Find out more at nchlondon.ac.uk forward slash pensycast. NCH London, unique degrees for curious minds.
part four, further analysis and discussion. I'm, I'm interested, uh, you both of your thoughts on uh, what, how far you follow Nietzsche's and how, how much you agree with them, your analysis of what you buy and what you don't buy. Mark, I know at, uh, at, from an earlier episode of the Partially Examined Life, I think you gave, you mentioned you gave a, uh, a quotation at your wedding on um, one must learn to love. This famous I have that in front of me. Do you, open. Do you can want I, to? Do you want I, to read? You can. Well, you've read it, but you're well trained in in the verse, so you have to. I would love to reread this. I th- so this is. I think that there are a lot of individual insights in Nietzsche that you know whether or not you think that he provides a uniform philosophy. Um, I think clearly he does uh, provide some uniform philosophy in a way that's not uh, not unique to him. I mean, don't yeah. be a dogmatist. Mm. Uh, there is no, you know, be, uh, uh, don't be otherworldly that it's much better to embrace the things of this world and the multiple interpretations and all the, you know, the things that that involves mm. in turning away from a fundamentally Christian worldview, uh, that would, you know, maybe lead to a sort of Christian totalitarianism or something. If you really took it seriously, right. The Pope running the world, but those, you know, apart from that, there are just so many individual little nuggets. So here's, here's one that's from the, uh, The gay science. One must learn to love. This is what happens to us in music. First, one has to learn to hear a figure and melody at all, to detect and distinguish it, to isolate it and delimit it as a separate life. Then it requires some exertion and goodwill to tolerate it in spite of its strangeness, to be patient with its appearance and expression and kind-hearted about its oddity. Finally, there comes a moment when we're used to it, when we wait for it, when we sense that we should miss it if it were missing. And now it continues to compel and enchant us relentlessly until we become its humble and raptured lovers who desire nothing better from the world than it and only it. But that is what happens to us not only in music. That is how we have learned to love all things that we now love. In the end, we are always rewarded for our goodwill, our patience, fair-mindedness, and gentleness with what is strange. Gradually, it sheds its veil and turns out to be a new and indescribable beauty. That is its thanks for our hospitality. Even those who love themselves will have learned it in this way. For there is no other way. Love too has to be learned. So that sure does sound different than uh, you know, <laughs> bore around like you know, exert your power on everyone that you yeah. meet. It's interesting because this is. Uh, it reminds me again of something I mentioned earlier in the episode that an old professor of mine who who didn't want Nietzsche on any of the courses. It was in an ethics uh, undergraduate who was giving a talk on the genealogy of morals and his conclusion. What Nietzsche has a very good argument that it seems that all um, that morals are relative, perhaps. And I, he picks up on, he's like, do you really think this? Do you really think Nietzsche's a good philosopher? And he attacked this, this student quite a lot. And I gave this quote to kind of back up the student. I said, look, how can you say that this, that Nietzsche isn't a philosopher? Listen to this. And, and then he, he responded, well, isn't this just a point about psychology? Is this not, you've mentioned this not there, Mark, but there's lots of <laughs> nuggets there of philosophy. Isn't it just the psychology of learning to love or learning to love a melody? Is there more to this quote than just uh, a psychological point? Well, doesn't it say something about value, that value is not univocal, it's not uniform? Mm. Again, the idea that truth and beauty and goodness all line up is this this old-fashioned picture that he's trying to reject that no uh you know so if you write aesthetic texts Mm. by talking about the beauty of form you know this is what he he points out in the birth of tragedy is is the the apollonian you know so that so he he does want to acknowledge that you know what makes a a ancient greek sculpture a nude beautiful that really is a kind of beauty like you know he's not trying Mm -hmm. to just reject that but if you if you then take an insight like that and form a whole philosophy of value around it, and so everything only becomes good or worthwhile insofar as it, in some sense, conforms with that unified picture. You know that ultimately, if you put it in religious language, is a pointing toward God or toward the other world. Um, that that is just fundamentally not the way the world works, and we can look at this process by which we can discover that something that we might not have thought was beautiful actually has its own unique beauty. Um, that is more like how we should be looking at, uh, 
you know, beauty in actions, beauty in ethics. It's not that everything mm-hmm. is equally, you know, whatever boorish, rude, uh, violent person that there's there's something special about everyone. You know, it's not, it's yeah. not uh, you know, entirely dismissing. That would be, again, this a, a, a hard edge relativism like, well, you find that beautiful. I find this beautiful. I guess we're just different. <laughs> well, it's interesting because like, on the first reading of the quote, it seems like it seems like psychological point of view. It's just he's just expressing how you've learned to love this person but there's obviously more to that isn't there how, how does it link in with this idea of uh, love and union with a person and and finding this is that why is it that you read this at your wedding what, what's important about this know. quote that, to you that was a number of years ago so i can't <laughs> i can't recreate exactly why what I, you know, I was still in grad school at the time so it but uh i think if you have an ideal of love of what your relationship is supposed to be of what your your uh, loved one is supposed to be like hmm. the person will fall short of that it's much better instead of having this the standard of value that you then measure people against if you actually pay attention to them hmm. and let their their behavior you know not that you're entirely uncritical hmm. um, but ultimately if you're making a commitment to a person you're saying I don't even know you know you you have depths that I can't even fathom right now but i'm just signing on that i'm on your side and we hopefully as a cooperative thing not just me gazing at you and adjusting my (laughs) expectations to your actual behavior but that we can cooperatively you know have this growth together where we are uh adjusting our 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 ideals to um you know what the other person is growing into you know, that seems a weird way to talk about it because, again, the beautiful just sounds like an objective standard. But maybe that's not the whole idea of objective standards of the good and, and the true and the beautiful in that way is exactly what Nietzsche is is teaching us how to, uh, let's say, get around, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> that we can we can no longer uh, accept those as objective facts about the world. But yet we still have a very active role for values and appreciating and, and stuff in, in our lives, in our way of dealing with each other and with uh, our, our way of even just thinking about even abstract values. Greg, how far do you follow Nietzsche? Oh, um, I would say much less than I used to. But I, I want to say that, that that was really a great uh, uh, discussion of that, that passage uh, yeah, really interesting stuff there. Um, I would say th- there's certain points on which I think he's pretty good, like you know his diagnosis of resentment and how it works. I, I actually make a, you know use of that. I find it um, it's helpful for clients sometimes when they're struggling with that. Mm-hmm. Um, interestingly, I, I, I do spend some time kind of talking people out of being Nietzscheans. <laughs> I have people who want to study with me, uh, you know, with the tutorial sessions where they want to do philosophical counseling and they're really, really into Nietzsche. And I'll say, well, do you think he's, he's actually right about this? Or are you reading this the right way? You know, and wean them slowly away from it. I think Nietzsche works well when he's not just Nietzsche by himself, but his, his ideas are being used in conjunction with, with other thinkers. And I'd say this is what a, a good number of the the um, you know reinterpreters of, of Nietzsche that I like have been doing with with him. Um, I like the the stress on on um, you know sort of a hard nosed look at at our culture and how we got here. I don't always buy all the parts of his story, but I think they're they're at least interesting uh, and sometimes on point. Um, I don't agree with him entirely about, you know, what, what went on with, say, Socrates and Plato. Um, you know, he says that that after Greek tragedy essentially got, got slain by, by Euripides and Socrates, Plato cobbled together, you know, boards out of the shipwreck, and that's where we get platonic dialogues from. So I don't buy that sort of stuff. But, but he, you know, even when, he's, when, he's, when you're like, this can't possibly be right, at least it's interesting stuff. Um, I do want to say one other thing too. Th- this notion that somehow, um, you know, this would be psychology and this over here would be philosophy. I and mean, we can do that with all sorts of disciplines. This is, this is, you know, religious thought. This is philosophy. This is history. This is philosophy. 
whenever people set up these really rigid distinctions, first off, I'm always distrustful of them because they seem rather ad hoc. And, and when you've got a sort of historical sense, you see that these these ideas about where these boundaries lie, they've been very shifting over mm-hmm. time. Um, but then I, I always ask the person, okay, so like, let's say we take, you know, uh, philosophy and theology. Is that a philosophical distinction or is that a theological distinction you're making? You know, because um, quite often they'll end up being a theological distinction. And you're like, well, you know, you just cut yourself off from the right to be on that side of the boundary. So how the hell are you doing it? And you can say the same thing with psychology, history, a lot of these other things. I think it's better to, you know, Maurice Blondel had this wonderful um, metaphor. He he talked about these different uh, disciplines and philosophy, not having boundaries or borders between them, but being sort of like two gases that permeate each other. Um, mm. And I think that's, that's, that's more on. Nietzsche had no problem thinking of himself as a psychologist. He actually praises Dostoevsky when, when Georg Brandes brought Dostoevsky to Nietzsche's attention. Um, he read Dostoevsky and said, this guy is a magnificent psychologist. He and I are you know, uh, talking about a lot of the same stuff. Um, so I, I, I don't see being a psychologist as, as a bad thing or something that, you know, makes you irrelevant to real philosophy. <laughs> you know? mm. It's almost, it's almost the opposite by saying, well, it's only this, you know, that's, that, that should be a sign to us that that's something in a certain sense, anti-philosophical is going on within philosophy, you know. Let us pause once again to hear from our fantastic sponsors, the New College of the Humanities. I was born in Canada and went to international schools uh, and I grew up in a few different countries, which was an experience I really enjoyed and something that I'm enjoying about NCH is the different people here. As soon as I heard the name New College of the Humanities, I knew it was something that might be interesting to me. The relationship that NCH had with me, even during the application process, was different from all the other universities. It reflects sort of um, values that NCH holds, making sure there's a good community and that people are having fun as well as like being really hard working. AC Graying would come and do a few lectures and those are particularly enjoyable because he really knows what he's talking about and he always seems to get everyone really engaged in these stories that he's telling because he's, Anthony's just got that way about him. When I was applying to NCH, there's obviously uncertainty about what about what you're going to get because it's a new institution and it doesn't have the the sort of established reputation that some of the other universities I was applying to had. It's obviously a a really big package that NCH is trying to deliver to students and it comes off really well when you're telling someone about that as a pitch for university but to see that it it actually works in practice um, was definitely not surprising but oh this institution is actually doing everything that it set out that they were going to do. You can still apply directly or through UCAS to NCH London for 2018 entry and be considered for a scholarship worth up to £2,000 per year. Find out more at nchlondon.ac.uk forward slash pansycast. NCH London, unique degrees for curious minds. You can find the link to the new College of the Humanities on our website as well as in the iTunes description. Okay, let's head back over to the discussion. Pop, 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 pop. Philosophy quiz. Pop, pop, philosophy quiz. And essentially what I do is I give you some quotations and you tell me who you think they're from, okay? Oh, I'm going to be terrible at that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right, so we're playing uh, Fred Rick Nietzsche. So we've got quotes from Frederick Trump, who was an American real estate developer and philanthropist, and he's also the father of the 45th President of the United States, Donald Trump. We have quotes from Ricky Gervais, uh, the English comedian, actor, writer, producer, and musician. And we've got (laughs) quotes from Nietzsche, the German philosopher, cultural poet, and philologist. Right, so you have to tell me who you think the quote's from. Get in, get it done, get it done right, and get out. See, I don't know if the Rick quotes would be one of his characters... (laughs) Because that could easily be something from The Office, but I would have to say Fred if I have to guess. Good, yeah, Mark. We'll, we'll play. Uh, we'll play first with three, and yeah, it's uh, it is Fred. But all the Ricky Gervais ones are straight from Ricky Gervais, another character. If you want, okay. Spirituality really lost its way when it became a stick to beat people with. Do this, or you'll burn in hell. I think that's Gervais. That sounds. That sounds. Yeah, like yeah. Rick. Gervais will take one all. Um, know everything you can about what you're doing. I bet that's Trump. Uh, let's say, yeah, 
Yeah, it's Trump for you. are close on that one. Glad you got that one right. You don't want to describe that one to Nietzsche. Is man... Oh, that's going to be too easy now, isn't it? If I jump to Nietzsche. I'm trying to, I'm trying to trick you both by jumping around, but you can, you can okay. work out my reasoning. That's the other thing I learned that day, that the truth, however shocking or uncomfortable, in the end leads to liberation and dignity. Let's say Rick. It's Rick. God damn it. Okay, we'll try one more. See if I can fool you it's with one more. It's just by the vernacular. It's not even <laughs> yeah, by yeah. the content. It's just the, the wording choice. Nietzsche is not going to say, the other thing that I learned that day. It, no. it, it's an easy one because Nietzsche is so distinct from other writers, especially from uh, from Frederick Trump and Ricky Gervais. <laughs> what we different. need is a more vernacular translation of Nietzsche, you know, where he's like, you know, you guys, uh, here's what I was, what I had on my mind, you know. <laughs> Uh, I'll try one last one then. One repays a teacher badly if one always remains nothing but a pupil. I think that's that Nietzsche. Sounds like Nietzsche. Yeah, it's Frederick yeah. Trump. He's caught you up. Oh. Uh, no, uh, that, one's, <laughs> that one's Nietzsche. That's not a Trump. That's Nietzsche. Very good. Right. Well, uh, we'll call that one a draw. We'll keep. Uh, we won't. We won't give a winner. We'll. Uh, we'll both. We'll all be winners on this one. Shall we uh, wrap up with some concluding remarks? Then anything which we've discussed uh, on the discussion we've had today. Do you want to kick us off, Mark? Well, I just want to thank uh, both of you and and Greg. Uh, this was a great discussion. I really appreciate what you folks are trying to do, bringing philosophy to that savage land of England, <laughs> and uh, hope to help you spread it throughout the uh, the very wide United States, which you know England could just fit in one of them. <laughs> Greg, yeah, I'd I'd like to say thanks as well. This has been a great conversation. Um, I've actually got a few things I've written down here that I want to think about more. Um, so that's always a a good thing. And uh, yeah, I don't think I have much more to say than that, other than thanks again. Yeah, guys, I want to really thank you both. I think this uh, this conversation has been really illuminating. I mean, I I'm someone who's always kind of had a uh, an interest in Nietzsche ever since I was quite young, and finally getting to do an episode on him, I've been reading a lot over the past month of just about, you know, every aspect that I could. And I think that one thing that I learned quite quickly um, was that, you know, Nietzsche is very dense and there's a, there's a lot there. And you've articulated his ideas so clearly for us today. And I just want to thank you for that because it's been really great just for clarifying a few things for myself. Um, and, you know, just, uh, you know, a lot of the very complex ideas, I think you've, just the way you've spoke about it has been fantastic. Um, and I've really enjoyed the discussion, you know, even to the very basic things of, you know, should we follow Nietzsche in inverted commas and what it means to be a Nietzsche? And I just love the the statement that we made at the start as well, that, you know, um, you have a hundred different people who would read his works and you'd have a hundred different interpretations. Um, and that's just been fantastic just to hear your different interpretations and how that kind of contrasts with ours as well. It's been fab. With that said, I think uh, my concluding remark is that my interpretation of Nietzsche is probably wrong in many respects. If there's a hundred interpretations, then mine doesn't seem like the right one. Uh, on the basis of uh, just reading Nietzsche in preparation to this episode, just reading the texts themselves, I came out with quite a, uh, I don't know, a more evil, well, again, <laughs> yeah, more selfish view of what, uh, what, what I should be like if I was a Nietzschean. And I think uh, that, that more optimistic or the good side of Nietzsche. I think we've drawn out that, that, that finding... Domesticated. Yeah. Okay. Domesticated Nietzsche. So, yeah, I think I'd, it, I've i definitely... Um, having that having these conversations brought some pieces together for what I think Nietzsche looks like in the world on the basis of what my interpretation was. Uh, I will emphasize to listeners again that you sh- I can't recommend Partially Examine Life enough. I've been listening to it for, for a long time. Me and Ollie do, and Andrew does as well. They've got uh, episodes on... Have you got every, the majority of Nietzsche's work now? So you've done a genealogy of morals, done truth and lying, um, on the birth of tragedy, on the gay science. Are there any others which you've covered? And Twilight of the Idols, I'm actually recording tomorrow, so that will be released before this is. And uh, if I've sounded too sympathetic to Nietzsche this time, um, <laughs> I plan on being mean to him tomorrow. I've, I've I'm kind of gotten fed up with his shtick this time, too. <laughs> so I, I will express... Uh, uh, the the other side of my my take on him in that um, links to the partial examine life are on our website and in the iTunes description as well. If you do enjoy the pan sidecast and especially our discussion on Nietzsche today, then you will love the partial examine life and that's partiallyexaminelife dot com. If you want to go straight there without clicking a link, Greg's work on his YouTube channel. Greg, you've done videos on a lot of the stuff which we've looked at, but you unpack it in so much more detail 
the he- your uh, Hegel series being a, a perfect example of that. So all the, if you're interested in uh, your videos on Camus are brilliant, uh, Aristotle, uh, Sartre as well, all these existentialists, these seems to be our most popular views and we get asked to do them again. What I will say until we recover them again is that Greg's work on his YouTube channel is, is the place to go. YouTube.com forward slash user forward slash GBI Sadler, link in the iTunes description and on our website as well. Greg's work is supported by his listeners. So if you enjoyed uh, Greg being on the podcast, so please support his work go to patreon.com forward slash sadler also you can donate to the partial exam and life on their website so that these projects and this cross-platform stuff is supported by you the listeners so please do that if you can thank you you've been listening to the wonderful soothing voices of dr gregory sadler life is a fountain of delight but where the rabble also drinks all wells are poisoned Mark Linson Meyer. This new tablet, oh my brothers, I place over you. Become hard. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Ollie Marley. Let your kindness become your final self conquest. And me, Jack Symes. God is dead, and we have killed him. <laughs>